Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Lost Princess of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So as always, this is part of the Wizard of Oz series. I've been doing this as a buddy read with Joel Swagman. I'm going to start with the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. All of you must inquire everywhere for Ozma and try to discover where she is hidden. Princess Ozma, ruler of the land of Oz, has gone missing. With no magical means of returning her, Dorothy and her friends must travel into unknown lands and confront strange new challenges in order to find her. However, Ozma could be anywhere, and only a very powerful sorcerer could be responsible. But who? So, let's get into it. There's no introductory essay to this one, uh, as there was in some of the earlier ones. And basically, Ozma disappears, and we start off with all of the characters we know and love. Like, Dorothy is in this from the start, which is always good, because normally they're kind of brought in as an afterthought. So it's, it's nice that they are the main characters again. And Ozma disappears, and Betsy Bobbin's like, why not look in the magic picture? That will tell us where she is in just one second. So they go to the magic picture, and someone's nicked it. And uh, it says the magic picture was gone. Only a blank space on the wall behind the curtain showed where it had formerly hung. And this is the first time in my memory where L. Frank Baum has directly confronted the fact that they have these magical objects that can basically do anything and has came up with a good reason as to why they can't just use that. And um, so yeah, Cake, the cook, wants to get her, uh, wants to get her dish pan back. She goes, who will go with me? No one answered the question, but after a period of silence, one of the yips said, We know what is here on the top of this flat hill, and it seems to us a very pleasant place, but what is down below, we do not know. The chances are it is not so pleasant, so we'd best stay where we are. It may be a far better country than this is, suggested the cookie cook. Maybe, maybe, responded another yip, but why take chances? Contentment with one's lot is true wisdom. Perhaps in some other country there are better cookies than you cook, but as we have always eaten your cookies and like them, except when they are burned on the bottom, we do not long for any better ones. It's kind of that whole like grass is always greener thing. And they get to this gulf uh, and the frog that sh the cookie cook cake or whatever is traveling with, he can jump across but she can't and she goes, see here frogman, why can't you carry me across the gulf when you leap it? You are big and strong while I am small and thin. The frogman gravely thought over this suggestion. It was a fact that Cake the Cookie Cook was not a heavy person. Perhaps he could leap the gulf with her on his back. But I've heard the expression, uh, never trust a skinny chef. Like, if your job is to bake cookies and you are thin, are you even sampling your own cookies to make sure they're okay? And the frog says something wonderingly, which bothers me because I don't like unnecessary adverbs. Okay, so I quite enjoyed this little passage here. So we get, Goodness me, cried Nellery, the winky wife, when she saw the strange couple approaching her house. I've seen many queer creatures in the land of Oz, but none more queer than this giant frog who dresses like a man and walks on his hind legs. Come here, Will John, she called to her husband, who was eating his breakfast, and take a look at this astonishing freak. Will John the winky came to the door and looked out. He was still standing in the doorway when the frogman approached and said with a hofty croak, Tell me, my good man, have you seen a diamond-studded gold dishpan? No, nor have I seen a copper-plated lobster, replied Will John in an equally hofty tone. And the frogman, um, he says, uh, I'm so wise that sometimes my wisdom makes my headache. I know so much that often I have to forget part of it, since no one creature, however great, is able to contain so much knowledge. Yeah, I know how you feel, mate. Um, and the Wizard of Oz says, Ozma is a fairy and so is Glinda, so no power can kill or destroy them. But you girls are all mortals and so are Button Bright and I, so we must watch out for ourselves. And literally earlier in the book, it mentioned that no one dies in Oz. It's very inconsistent with that, even from like this within the same book. We get a reference to the country surrounding the Emerald City being thickly settled, which is something I pointed out in my last review because one of my author friends who sadly passed away, um, but he contributed a story to an anthology I edited called Thickly Settled, so it just sort of stood out to me. And this is very Tolkien-like as well. Um, Dorothy asks what the people in this, this land are like, no one knows, for no one has ever passed the merry-go-round mountains, was the reply. But it's said that the thistle heaters hitch dragons to their chariots, and that the Herkus are waited upon by giants whom they have conquered and made their slaves. So we get this. What is that around your waist, Dorothy? asked the wizard. That? Oh, that's just the magic belt I once captured from the Gnome King, she replied. A magic belt? Why, that's fine. I'm sure a magic belt would take you over these hills. It might if I knew how to work it, said the little girl. Ozma knows a lot of its magic, but I've never found out about it. All I know is that while I'm wearing it, nothing can hurt me. Try wishing yourself across and see if it will obey you, suggested the wizard. But what good would that do, asked Dorothy. If I got across, it wouldn't help the rest of you, and I couldn't go alone among all those giants and dragons while you stayed here. I mean, you could try wishing that Ozma was there next to you. If it works, you don't need the rest of the book, do you? 
and uh, we learn we learn about um, the high cocoa la rum. Um, someone says, "How does it happen that the fists have no king to rule over them?" Hush," whispered the high cocoa la rum, looking uneasily around to make sure they were not overheard. In reality, I am the king, but the people don't know it. They think they rule themselves, but the fact is, I have everything my own way. No one else knows anything about our laws, and so I make the laws to suit myself. If any oppose me or question my acts, I tell them it's the law and that settles it. If I called myself king, however, and wore a crown and lived in royal style, the people would not like me and might do me harm. As the high cocoa rum of thee, I am considered a very agreeable person. That sounds like the way that conservative politicians rule when they're in power. And uh, Toto loses his growl. And Indy goes, where is my growl? You may search me, said the woozy. I don't care for such things myself. You snore terribly, asserted Toto. It may be, said the woozy. What one does when asleep, one is not accountable for. I wish you would wake me up sometime when I'm storing and let me hear the sound. Then I can judge whether it's terrible or delightful. I used to joke about that when I was a kid. Wake me up so I can, you can, I can hear myself snoring. And uh, the, the lion here, he has a bit of wisdom, which I think is great. Because again, a lot of this is just cool stuff, like teaching kids about morality and the world and stuff. So the lion says, Were we all like the sawhorse, we would all be sawhorses, which would be too many of the kind. Were we all like Hank, we would be a herd of mules. If like Toto, we would be a pack of dogs. Should we all become the shape of the woozy, he would no longer be remarkable for his unusual appearance. Finally, were you all like me? I would consider you so common that I would not care to associate with you. To be individual, my friends, to be different from others, is the only way to become distinguished from the common herd. Let us be glad, therefore, that we differ from one another in form and in disposition. Variety is the spice of life, and we are various enough to enjoy one another's society. So let us be content. And we learn about the Tsar over, um, and Dorothy says, I don't believe your Tsar over can hold a candle to our Ozma. He wouldn't hold a candle under any circumstances, or to any living person, replied the man very seriously. For he had slaves to do such things, and the mighty Vig is too dignified to do anything that others can do for him. He even obliges a slave to sneeze for him if ever he catches cold. And we get this sentence that, I guess it's just my edition, has been badly edited, so it says, The strong monarch treated them very nicely and gave the wizard a little golden vial of Zazoso to use if ever he or any of his... Full stop. If ever they what? Um, we have a, an issue here as well, so there's just some weird spacing there. So we've got from the Emerald City. I don't know why it does that. And Cake the Cookie Cook, who's, um, and the frog who's said to be like the wisest person in the land. He falls into uh, a pool of uh, the truth pond, so he can only tell the truth after that. And we get, a great misfortune has befallen me, he told himself. For hereafter I cannot tell people I am wise, since it is not the truth. The truth is that my boasted wisdom is all a sham, assumed by me to deceive people and make them defer to me. In truth, no living creature can know much more than his fellows, for one may know one thing and another know another thing, so that wisdom is evenly scattered throughout the world. Hmm, very true. And then the king of the, like, these stuffed bears, the king says, um, he's off and he says, All I ask is that you bears behave yourselves while I am away. If any of you is naughty, I'll send him to some girl or boy in America to play with. Ugh, what a threat. Terrifying. Do we have another one of these weird errors um, here where it just randomly starts a new paragraph in the middle of a sentence? Dorothy says something musingly, which as we all know is one of my hate. Another weird little bit of formatting here where the indentation suddenly jumps forward for no apparent reason. And we get this great little bit. I quite like this because this is almost feminist, you know. Um, I had no idea Ugu had such an army as that, said Dorothy. The castle doesn't look big enough to hold them all. It isn't, declared the wizard, but they all marched out of it. They seem to, but I don't believe it is a real army at all. If Hugo the Shoemaker had so many people living with him, I'm sure the Tsarova of Herku would have mentioned the fact to us. They're only girls, laughed Scraps. Girls are the fiercest soldiers of all, declared the frogman. They are more brave than men, and they have better nerves. This is probably why the magician uses them for soldiers and has sent them to oppose us. My only quibble with that is, shouldn't it be braver as opposed to more brave? I don't know, maybe not. I'd have to look that one up. And Scraps laughs jeeringly as well. But yeah, they eventually find Ozma, go home. All is good. They even find the dishpan. Um, so yeah, The Lost Princess of Oz, actually one of my favourites of the last half a dozen or so of these that I've read. Um, I think it's because uh, Dorothy and those lot are main characters from the beginning. So it kind of feels like going back to the you know early days of the series. Um, and it just feels as though Baum has like, embraced Oz more than he has done for a while because for the last god knows how many books it's kind of felt as though he's just done with it and he's just you know going through the motions so it was nice to actually read one where you know 
it feels like he's enjoying himself writing it. So I gave this one a 4 out of 5 and I'm looking forward to continuing the series. I don't think there's many left of the original L. Frank Baum ones now. Um, and Joel and I, we were going to continue reading all of the other ones, but I don't know if he still wants to because... I think from the sounds of it, he's, he's kind of sick of it by now, so we'll see. Maybe he enjoyed this one as much as I did, and if so, he might be up for reading some more. And also, a lot of his problems have actually been to do with L. Frank Baum and his writing style and like the lack of consistency from book to book, so that might even get solved when it moves on to other writers after his death. There we have it. That's what I made of The Lost Princess of Oz by L. Frank Baum. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.